Today, you have brought us together to have a conversation on restructuring, which is one of the major issues in our national discourse. And I commend the paper presented by the chairman of the board. I'm happy that the discussions here are eminent personalities that will do justice to the topic. I commend the Daily Trust Media Group for bringing these eminent Nigerians together to brainstorm on this topical issue that has seized the attention of our country. Chief Ayo Adebanjo, I wouldn't say much again because the board chairman has already explained who he is, a leader of the Athene Ferry, prominent member of the Zikis movement, attended most of our conferences that were uh, conferences designed to shape this country. Chief John Nia Wodo, because just left the Indigo, our nation Indigo Cultural Organization as the national president, and now the leader of the Southern and Middle Best uh, Forum. We commend you and congratulate you for this your new assignment. Of course, Atairu Muhammadu Jega, because he was the chair of INEC, so everybody knows so much about him, because he's a professor of political science, so I know it will lead us through. <clears throat> and uh, when he was the president of the uh, Academic Staff Union of Universities, it was a period when civil society confronted the guns, so he knows it all. The concept of the structure is not new to us as Nigerians. Before the Civil War, Nigeria operated with four regions. At the onset of the war, General Yakubu Gowan, then head of state, thought that running Nigeria under the regional structure posed a threat to the unity and sovereignty of our country. So he opted to restructure Nigeria into 12 states. There were not mixed reactions for and against across the nation or our people. But at the end, the 12 state structure remained. What General Liakuku did in a war situation preserved our nation and saved us from disintegration. A nation is an organic being whose life is characterized by reforms, adaptation, and structural changes. At independence in 1960, the the population of Nigeria was about 45 million. And our early leaders and the British colonial government decided that the young nation was too vast and complex to be governed centrally from Lagos. Thus, they bequeathed a federal system of government with strong regional autonomy and a unifying central government. This arrangement was also accepted and reaffirmed by the Republican Constitution of 1963. Six years, sorry, 60, 61 years after independence, our population is now estimated to have exploded to over 200 million people. In the same vein, the call for restructuring has continued to grow and is growing louder every day. Within these six decades, our political space has assumed many colorations. We had gone from the three regions to 36 states and 774 local government councils. And we moved away from when the different regions have a different arrangement to manage the local government level to a unified local government system across the country. Yet, all that did not seem to have provided an answer to the questions on the administrative structure of our country and how best it should be governed. As president, I had the privilege of celebrating our nation's golden jubilee in 2010 and the centenary of our amalgamation in 2014. When, I, <clears throat> when we are to celebrate these milestones, some Nigerians challenged our intentions, arguing that the amalgamation was faulty. They insisted 
that there were no reasons to celebrate because they believe that the amalgamation has not helped the growth of our country. My belief is that all nations have their unique history. Professor Jika will tell us as a professor of uh, political science. The amalgamation is not the problem, by my belief. Rather, there was too much emphasis on divisive politics, and this has greatly affected our nation's unity. <clears throat> it was the need to address these issues that my administration elected six years ago <clears throat> to convene the 2014 National Conference, which I inaugurated on March 17, 2014, in Abuja, for the specific purpose of addressing some of the issues that have been agitating the minds of our people. As a country, we have our peculiar challenges, and we should devise means of solving them. But we should not continue to vent our spleen on the amalgamation. As Shakespeare in Julius Caesar said, the fault is not in our stars, but in ourselves. My conviction is that discussion on restructuring will not help except we restructure our minds because some of the challenges or some of the challenging issues at the national level still exist at the state and local levels. In Nigeria, it's very easy for people to point at the central government because I was there and I, I felt the pulse. But sometimes what is happening at the center is also happens at the state level, at the local government level, and sometimes even in our communities. There are some states that based on the part of the map of the state that you come from, or the language you speak, or how you worship your God, you can't even try to contest election as a governor. Nobody will even look at you. Go to how local government, our states conduct their local government elections. For example, in this country, the guy will know more because he was the chair of INEC. There are some states that when the national electoral body conduct the general elections, opposition parties could win some seats in the state assembly. They could win some seats in the national assembly, both House of Rep and Senate. But when we get to the local elections that the state governors will conduct. Those parties that probably even have one senator and some two, three members of House of Rep and some five members of the state assembly can't even win a councillorship seat. Not to talk about a chairmanship seat. Do we need restructuring to solve that anomaly? And how do we restructure to make sure that those things don't happen again? This shows that restructuring alone may not solve all the anomalies in our system. I believe that restructuring for a better nation is good, but there are other fundamental issues we should also address. We cannot restructure in isolation without tackling the challenges that polarize our nation. These include nepotism, ethnic and religious differences, <clears throat> as well as lack of patriotism. The issues of tribe and religion have continued to limit our unity and progress as a nation. Let me tell you a bitter experience. I cannot say a bitter experience, but funny conversation I had with a teacher. He happens to be one of my former students. And as I left office, I was free, so more people can come to me. And I said, Mr. President, what we are seeing in some of the schools, especially around Abuja and some of these areas, is that sometimes, even at the primary level, it's so difficult for Muslim children and Christian children to sit together and play. There is this kind of mutual suspicion. It may not be happening in all the schools, but the teacher told me, and I felt it because I know most of us here who attended schools in those days, primary schools and secondary schools, that Muslims and Christians stay together and they are. Well, no mutual suspicion. You don't see any of them as an enemy. 
And it reminds me, some time ago, when I read a short story by late Gabriel Okara on children literature. It's a story titled Little Snake and Little Frog. And that story goes that there was a day the little frog, the baby frog and the baby snake went to play and they enjoyed themselves playing. And both of them went home. And when Mama Frog asked Little Frog, who did you play with? I said, oh, I played with a little snake. Then Mama Frog warned, look, those are the people that eat us. Don't play with, run. when you see them, run away. And when the baby snake went home, the mama snake also asked, who did you play with? And the baby snake said, I play with little frog. And the master said, that is our food. When next you see, just eat it. The following morning, baby frog and baby snake went out again. They met somewhere from a distance. Baby frog stopped, was no longer moving. Now baby snake said, come, 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 let us play, come. Then the baby frog said, no, 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 what your mom told you, my mom also told me. And baby frog turned back and started running back home. Our, some of our conversations in this country is taking the dimension of baby frog and baby snakes. We are making our children to hate themselves instead of our children coming together collectively to build a nation. Leadership is like giving care to a sick person. Society and individuals are almost the same. If you have major problems, sometimes the drugs doctors will prescribe at the first level of treatment will be different as you continue to progress and improve. So it's nation building. I would like to refer us to the experiences of two African countries which attempted to tackle the problem of diversity from a different perspective than ours at independence. Tanzania, under the leadership of Julius Nyerere, and Ghana, under Kwame Nkrumah. I may not go to specifics, because there are professors of political science here. They went to the ex extreme to advocate one party state, which leaned towards the left. We are first a bit to the left. Both leaders emphasize strong national governments to promote national unity and patriotism, which departed from our own regional approach, which was based on strong regional parties and political competition for power between the regions. From independence, the struggle was our politics was based on regions. And there was this tension it's a dynamic duo between the regions who will produce the national leaders, and that is still haunting us till today. Let me state for the record that I strongly oppose both the philosophy and the idea of one party state. No, I don't believe that is the best, as well as a unitary system of government as a situation, as a solution to ethnic and cultural diversity. That cannot solve the problems. I believe that federalism and liberal multi-party democracy offer by far the best opportunities for good governance in a multi-ethnic nation like Nigeria. Yet, it is obvious that the initial emphasis of Tanzania and Ghana on promoting national unity, patriotism among citizens, and strong national parties that cut across ethnic regional and religious divides, and leadership orientation that promotes fairness, justice for all, and love of country have helped both Ghana and Tanzania in their journey of nationhood. It has helped them to better manage some of the extreme ethnic and religious divisions that have dampened the unity and progress of our own country. I remember last October I was in Tanzania. Uh, I led the African Union team to observe their elections. And I had a conversation with the foreign minister, a cerebral professor of law, quite a senior person. And he told me, he was looking, we were looking at the Nigerian structure and the Tanzanian structure. I said that he worked with uh, uh, Julius Nyerere, that sometimes 
Some people don't know why Julius Serere opted for a one-party state. That as at that time, Tanzania was a very complex country, so many tribes, so many languages. And they have two major religions, Christianity and Islam. In Tanzania's main area, Christianity and Islam is almost like 50-50. But Zanzibar, which is a semi-autonomous part of uh, Tanzania, uh, mo uh, Muslims are just about 80 or even 80-something percent. Christians, I believe, less than 20 percent. So you have that kind of structure. So that Julius Irene said he was going to do two things to unite his country. First was one party state. That if he takes multi parties, some parties will take religious angles and polarize the country based on religion. Some parties will take ethnic lines and will polarize the country based on ethnicity. Then the second thing he did was these multi multiple languages they were speaking will not help them. And that he has to encourage one major language. And luckily for him, which in Nigeria we don't have, we have Pan East African uh, language, the, um, the Swahili. So encourage the teaching of Swahili at the primary and the secondary level, to the extent that all their textbooks were translated into Swahili. So Swahili and English become the legal franca, and they emphasize more on Swahili that is even spoken by some of the tribes. So everybody now speaks Swahili. So in national conversation, they use Swahili. Even if you go to observe election, anybody, you can talk with anybody if you understand Swahili. So after finishing secondary school, they are not even so fluent in English, but everybody speaks Swahili. So that one party system and the common language that all of them use, try to unify them. They still have their political problems, but it's not based on religion, it's not based on tribe. But well, just like I say, every society evolves. When Joshua Rere left later, the president then felt that they should go multi-party. And a referendum in 1992, a referendum was called, and 80% still voted for one party because they believed that that one party is helping their unity. 20% voted for multi-party. Joshua Rere was still alive then, but he encouraged them that, look, Yes, 80% voted for more, uh, in it, uh, one party, but the whole world is going multi-party. Tanzania cannot be left behind. So even though one party state was 80%, but they now moved to multi-party. But even as they moved to multi-party, the Nyerere's party is still the only party that continues to win presidency till today. Another country that we may mention is Rwanda. Rwanda is another recent example where polarization on ethnic lines nearly destroyed that beautiful country in 1994, leading to extreme inter-ethnic hatred, anarchy, violence, and killings. It is the recent example of genocide. Today, Rwanda has stepped back from ethnic bigotry and division to a system that emphasizes national unity and leadership performance and patriotism. Rwanda has made tremendous progress along this path. So Rwanda was a very a basket case in 1994. Today they have gone out of that because of some reforms they have done. These three countries are by no means the only models, I'm not advocating that these are the models Nigeria must copy and paste. But I just use it to illustrate that a country is an organic system that we can evolve new ways of doing things and make our country better. As leaders at different levels, we should encourage a healthy conversation on restructuring and reforms that steer national pride and love and faith of our citizens in our beloved country. Nigeria is still the greatest gift history has bestowed on us and, of course, the black race with a huge potential for greatness, prosperity, and happiness for our people. Nigeria as a nation, we can say, we can say it's blessed. We are not saying it's 100%. Sometimes we exaggerate what we have. But even if you look at the environment, we have the Atlantic Ocean, that most countries are not exposed to the oceans, that we can move from there to any part of the world. 
And even if you look at the vegetation from the mangrove swamps within the Niger Delta to the rainforest areas, to the Guinea Savannah, Sudan Savannah, and the Sahel, we have flat lands, and we even have the hilly parts, like Mambila Plateau area, that you can even grow subtropical plants. Of course, in terms of minerals, too, there are all zones of this country have some minerals. Some have been developed, some not yet developed. And the most important thing about Nigeria is that we have the human beings with the very cranial capacities that they are making impact across the world. Just the human resources can make significant changes. So if we manage ourselves well, they will continue to be a pride to the world and the black race. Like, but like every other nation, Nigeria is a project in progress and should, con and should confidently discuss our experiences and fashion art solutions to improve on our performance and the well-being of all citizens. We should all do our little best in our little corners to overcome the challenges we face and work hard to reposition our country for a greater and more prosperous tomorrow for our children and grandchildren. This cannot be achieved without, deli without deliberate effort to promote national unity and love of country by all our leaders and our citizens. We owe ourselves and the coming generations a duty to reduce the bile and embrace one another so that restructuring for a better and greater Nigeria can be meaningful and can guarantee the nation's economic development and the welfare of our citizens. We should never lose hope in our nation, for the future is still bright. With the robust character of our people and the unbeatable resilience of our spirit, I have no doubt that our country will continue to be great. May this platform shed more light on our path forward as a nation. As chairman of today's event, I'm not meant to really discuss the issue of restructuring because the eminent people selected are those who really lead us through. My duty is to open. So I hereby declare open today's dialogue and I believe these three eminent Nigerians will interrogate this topic that all of us will be proud. I thank you all.